Hello everyone, Foxy here, and welcome to Mostly Mental. We're now a few videos into a series on knot theory, and as a mathematical discipline, knot theory falls under the broader umbrella of topology, that is, stretchy geometry. But many of the most powerful tools in a mathematician's toolkit aren't topological, they're algebraic. Fortunately, topologists have found a way to make use of those tools anyway. So today, I'd like to bring the full force of algebra to bear on knot theory, using what are known as fundamental groups and knot groups. Suppose we have a park with a tree and a pond in it, like so. And suppose there's a duck who lives in this pond. And every day, this duck goes for a walk around the park without ever leaving the boundaries of the park or flying over the tree, and then ends up back at the pond. What different paths can it take? Well, it could walk in a circle, like so, or it could walk in some sort of self-intersecting, twisty path like this, or it could walk in a loop around the tree, or it could take a slightly wider loop around the tree. But are those really different paths? I mean, these two loops around the tree feel a lot alike. In fact, we could stretch this small one out into the big one without ever leaving the park or passing through the tree. In other words, we can continuously deform this path into this one. And we can actually do the same thing with these two paths. We can take this path here and uncross it and drag it over here to get this one. And again, that's a continuous deformation. So fundamentally, these are the same path, too. But these are not the same path, since there's no way to stretch this over to this side without having to pass the path through the tree. And in general, we'll say that two paths are equivalent if we can continuously deform one into the other. In order to bring algebra into the mix, we need to find some sort of structure in these paths. And the most natural choice of structure is what's known as a group. To be a group, a set needs to have an operation to combine elements, like addition or multiplication. This operation needs to be associative, which means you can regroup the elements however you want without changing the result, there needs to be an identity, which is a do-nothing element, like adding zero or multiplying by one. And there need to be inverses, so some way to undo every element, like adding a negative or multiplying by a reciprocal. In the case of our paths, the most natural operation is to just add the paths together by walking along one and then the other. And since both paths start and end at the pond, their sum will as well. So it will always be a valid path. If we have three paths, it doesn't matter whether we walk A and B and then C, or A and then B and C, we're still walking A, then B, then C. The grouping doesn't really matter. So this addition is associative. And there's also a do-nothing path, where the duck just sits still in the pond all day. If we add that to any path, we don't change it. So we have an identity. And the inverse of a path is just walking it in the other direction. Notice that if we add the path to its inverse, we get a thin path, which we can then deform continuously by shortening it, until we get back to a single point. So, adding these together gives us the identity, and we have inverses. And putting all of this together 
we get a group. More generally, if we have some topological space and some base point P within it, then the collection of closed loops with equivalence under continuous deformation will form a group. And this group turns out to be really important, so it's known as the fundamental group of the space. One reason the fundamental group is so interesting is that it lets us distinguish between different shapes. In topology, we're allowed to stretch and deform a shape as much as we like, so long as we don't tear a hole in it or pass it through itself. So this cube is the same as a sphere, since we can just round off the corners. And this coffee cup is the same as a donut, or torus, since we can flatten out the cup part and be left with just a handle. But the sphere and the torus are different. How do we know? Well, let's look at their fundamental groups. Say we have a sphere like so. Consider a loop on its surface. Notice that we can take that loop and shrink it a little, bringing each of its points closer to the base point. And if we keep shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, eventually the loop will collapse down to just a single point. So this loop, and in fact every loop on a sphere, is equivalent to just sitting at the base point, which means the fundamental group for the sphere just has one element, the do-nothing identity loop. That is, it's the trivial group. Okay, then how about the torus? Well, we could go through the hole in the middle, and it turns out there's no way to shrink this loop down without coming off the surface of the torus, or we could also go around the hole. And again, there's no way to shrink this loop down to a point either. And it turns out we can't transform this loop into this one. So we have two fundamentally distinct loops. And with some care, you can prove that every loop on a torus is equivalent to some number of these plus some number of these. That is, the fundamental group is isomorphic to the pairs of integers z squared. So the fundamental group for the sphere is trivial, and the fundamental group for the torus is z squared. And those are different groups, which means the sphere and the torus have to be topologically different. How does all this relate to null? A natural guess might be that we're interested in the fundamental group of a knot. But a loop on a knot is just moving back and forth along its length. And if we deform away any backtracking we run into, then what we end up with is just an integer number of laps around the knot. So every knot is going to have a fundamental group that's isomorphic to the integers and that's not terribly useful for distinguishing between them. Okay, then what can we do to get useful information? The trick is to look at the fundamental group not of the knot itself, but of the space around it, the complement of the knot. And what we end up with is known as the knot group. For example, let's look at our trefoil. What loops can we find? Well, we could have a loop that goes around this strand here. Let's call that A. Or we could have loops that go around this strand here, or this strand here. We'll call those B and C, respectively. What about a loop that goes through the central region, like this one? Well, notice that we can deform that loop by taking this bit here and stretching it back to the base point. And if we do that, we end up with something that looks a lot like this pink loop. And that loop first goes around this strand, which is, as we said, B, and then goes around this one, which is A, which gives us that this is equal to BA. 
But hang on, that's not the only way we can deform the loop. If instead we drag this over to this side before we bring it back, then we end up with a loop around A and then around C. So we have AC. Or if we drag this around to here, then we end up with CB. And since those are all the same loop, that means that BA must be equal to AC and CB. And if we play around with those equations a bit, we get that C is equal to A inverse BA, which means that we can make C using only A and B. And we also get this nice relationship here between A and B, which means that the not group is defined by two elements, A and B, satisfying this relation. As a side note, this particular group is known as the braid group. We'll see that again in a future video, so keep it in the back of your mind. How can we generalize this approach to get the knot group for any knot? Well, once again, we can create a loop around each strand. To get a consistent description, we'll also need to give the knot a direction. And by convention, we'll give a name to each loop that passes over the knot from left to right and under from right to left relative to the direction of the knot, and the other way around will be the inverse. So, for example, if we follow this loop this way, we'll get A inverse. What relations does this group satisfy? Well, say we have a loop like so, passing around two strands next to a crossing. As before, we can stretch it in the middle back to the base point, and we can see that this is equivalent to a loop around x and then another around y. So we get xy. But also notice that we can drag the loop to this side of the crossing. And by the same logic, we end up with zx. So we get that xy equals zx. And we'll get a constraint of this form for every crossing in the knot. Putting them all together gives us the structure for the knot group. And this is known as the Vertinger presentation. For example, if we have our figure eight knot like so, we get these constraints. Or if we have a knot like this one, we get this knot group. So now we've got a way to find and express the knot group. But how do we actually use it? The real power of algebra isn't in any one group, but rather in the mappings between them, the so-called homomorphisms. A homomorphism is a mapping from one group to another that preserves all of the structure. For instance, say we have the integers and the integers mod 5 both with the operation of addition. Then the most natural mapping sends 0 to 0, 1 to 1, and so on. And then when we get to 5, we start over and send it to 0, when 6 goes to 1, and we repeat this pattern down the line. And say we take any two numbers, maybe 3 and 6, and we can add them together to get 9. And notice that 3 maps onto 3, and 6 maps onto 1, and 3 plus 1 is 4, and 9 maps onto 4. And this same property holds for any two numbers we pick. The value the sum maps onto is the sum of the values the two numbers map onto. This rule here is what it means to be a homomorphism. And this isn't the only possible homomorphism here. We might just as well map 0 onto 0, 1 onto 2, 2 onto 4, and so on. Or we might take everything and map it onto 0. But all of these maps will follow this same rule. What does all this mean for knots? Well, we want to be able to distinguish between knots 
And we can do that by looking at which homomorphisms exist and how many there are. For example, consider the homomorphisms from this knot group onto the group of symmetries of a triangle, called the dihedral group. Every loop in our knot group is equivalent to some combination of the loops around each individual strand, that is, their generators for the group. And our homomorphism rule tells us how to map combinations. So really, we only need to know where a homomorphism maps the generators to understand what it does for the whole group. If any one of the generators gets mapped onto one of these three rotations, then it's possible to show that every generator will map to that same rotation. And if a generator gets mapped onto one of the reflections, then every generator will map onto some, possibly different, reflection. I'll leave the proof of that as an exercise for you. Here, I've drawn all the mappings consistent with these constraints. I've color-coded the strands of the knot to show which symmetry the corresponding loop maps onto. So, this loop here is green, which means that A maps onto this reflection. If you watched the last video, these diagrams with reflections might look familiar. They're the three colorings of the knot. In fact, that will generally be true. The three colorings of a knot are the homomorphisms of the knot group onto the symmetries of a triangle, which includes some reflections. And similarly, the five colorings are the homomorphisms onto the symmetries of a pentagon, seven colorings for a heptagon, and so on. But of course, there are lots of other groups that we could map onto. So the knot group lets us extend this notion of coloring to a much wider setting. A knot uniquely determines its knot group. And a natural question we might ask is whether the converse is true, and the knot group uniquely determines a knot. In other words, does every knot have a different knot group? It turns out the answer is no. Here we have two different knots, which, as an exercise, you can prove both have this same knot group. So the knot group isn't powerful enough to distinguish between every pair of knots. But both of these knots look like they're made of the same parts. They both look like two trefoils just stuck together at the dotted line. And it turns out every knot can be broken down into components like this, known as prime knots. And the knot group can distinguish between those. So join me next time as we take a deeper look at the primes. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you again soon.